thank you very much. Uh, welcome to a virtual meeting of the External Services Select Committee at the London Borough of Hillingdon. This virtual meeting is also being broadcast simultaneously on the Council's YouTube channel, Hillingdon London. The purpose of this committee is to monitor Council services and their performance within its remit and undertake in-depth reviews and witness sessions on topics submitting any findings to the decision-making cabinet. My name is Councillor John Riley, and I am the chairman of this committee. Uh, some, some online housekeeping uh, rules, please. Before we start, some important online housekeeping for everyone pre present. Please ensure any mobile phones around you are on silent. Please keep your microphone muted when not speaking and then unmute to speak. As chairman, I will call on those uh, who wish to speak during the meeting. I'll come back to that in a moment. In terms of uh, technical uh, meeting control, if any council leaves the virtual meeting partway through for a period of time uh, or has a lost connection, I will continue the meeting unless we're not quorum, which is five councillors. But I think we have pretty much everybody here. Before we move on to the agenda, I'd like to do a roll call of the councillors and others present to confirm their attendance. Uh, please indicate that you are present when I say your names. That means turning your mics on and saying here or present or whatever it is. So, first of all, Councillor Nick Dennis. I'm here, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Simon Arnold. Good evening, Chairman. I too am here. Thank you. Councillor Vanessa Haranji. Present, Chairman. Councillor Stuart Mathers. Good evening, I'm present. Thank you. Councillor Ali Malali. Evening, Chair, I'm present. Councillor June Nelson. Good evening, Chairman, I'm present. Thank you. And Councillor Eddie Lavery, who is substituting for Councillor Debbie Radia. Good evening, Good evening Chairman, I'm present. Thank you. I'm now going to go through the list of people we uh, hope are here or may be here and perhaps they can do the same by indicating their presence. Uh, Rachel Benton, Programme Director of Hillingdon uh, Redevelopment, Hillingdon Hospital Redevelopment. Good evening, I'm present. Dr Ian Goodman, Chairman of Hillingdon CCG. Good evening, I'm present. Uh, Jason uh, Sees, Acting CEO for Hillingdon Hospital Trust. Good evening, present. Sir Neil McKay, uh, Strategic Advisor. Well, we heard something, but can you say if you're present, Sir Neil? Okay, I'll move on. Uh, Tahir Ahmed. I am present, sir. Sorry for the delay. No, no, not at all, not at all. Uh, to hear Ahmed, Executive Director of the of Estates and Facilities. Yeah, good evening, I'm present. Dr. Abbas Kaku, Clinical Lead. I'm present. Sarah Bellman, Communications and Engagement Lead. Good evening, present. Thank you. Caroline Morrison, Managing Director of Hillingdon CCG. I saw Caroline was being invited earlier but okay well we'll move on um yeah okay uh, and in relation to the second topic this evening dan kennedy uh good evening i'm present thank you dan uh jackie robertson good evening i'm present hi jackie and Chief Inspector Richard Watkinson. Good evening, Chair President. Thank you. And um, Nikki's put a name at the bottom, but um, she's here anyway, so we know. Good, excellent. I said I'd come back to the method by which uh, people want to indicate that they want to speak. I think the best thing, because we can't see everybody, although I can see most people, is um, if you uh, turn your mic on if you want to speak and just say something like mr chairman i'd like to speak something like that then i'll know who it is if you give me your name uh, unless i can see who it is and then uh, i'll allow you to speak because i'm not sure we've got 
the hands up facility and I, it, it, there's too many of us to use the chat so if you just indicate you want to speak that would be good all right so um we can now move on to the um, agenda and uh, first of all apologies for absence Chairman, we've had apologies for absence from councillor radia and councillor labour is here as her substitute thank you very much uh, declarations of interest in matters coming before the meeting um apart from the usual anyone got any other in, uh, declarations of interest i see shaking of heads all right thank you um the usual reference to exclusion of press and public all items are to considered in the public in part one but there aren't any items in part two um Item four, to receive and agree the minutes of the meeting on the 11th of February, 2020. I'll take these minutes as agreed unless anyone has any um, amendments. I see nods all round, thank you, agreed. I'll take that as um, agreed, thank you. And to receive and agree the minutes of the meeting of the 14th of uh, May, which was terribly quick. Um, and again, I'll take that as read if everyone's happy. I see nods all round. All right, thank you very much. So we go on, please, to item six uh, of our agenda this evening, uh, which is the redevelopment of uh, Hillingdon Hospital. And just as a sort of opening uh, few words, this is, this is a, a, a most welcome situation as far as this committee, and I know as far as the council is concerned, that, that I, I was going to say round this table, but of course it's a, a sort of hypothetical table that we sit around this evening. Uh, but nobody around this table uh, would uh, dispute the need and the long term and long time awaited need for a new hospital uh, in this borough. And we all know uh, from long experience what the issues and problems have been. Uh, so we look forward to uh, hearing about this. We've all read, and you can take it, uh, anyone that is going to speak on this uh, before us this evening, that we have all read uh, in great detail the document that was sent uh, to us, uh, the um, Hillington Hospitals NHS Foundation Trust report uh, to this uh, meeting on plans for redevelopment of Hillington Hospital. So who is going to um, start from Hellingdon as far as this topic is concerned? Chair, if it if it's okay, what we proposed for is if myself and Ian just give a short overview to start with and, and then sort of lead the discussion from there. Yep, that's great. Okay, off you go, Jason. Thank you, Chair. So what has happened sort of already, you've met the team, so You've got Ian Goodman and Caroline Morrison from the CCG. So Neil McKay, who's the strategic advisor to the programme. Rachel, who's very much running the, the, the programme in terms of the PMO. Abbas, who's the clinical lead. Tahir is the director of estates and facilities. And Sarah, who's leading on our communications. Uh, the agenda item is very much about the new hospital. The one uh, I'd just like to uh, raise with the committee first so that you're appropriately briefed is that tomorrow uh, the Care Quality Commission, so the CQC, who are sort of the, one of the main regulators of healthcare in England, they will be making an announcement uh, concerning the trust management uh, around COVID-19 and its infection prevention and control practices. Um, we regret this, but what we'd like to assure the committee is that we are taking this very seriously and we'll commit to coming back to the committee uh, when it's convenient to you just to explain everything that's going on uh, around the pandemic planning and our infection prevention control practices. But I thought I would just like to bring that to the committee's attention at the beginning uh, before we move on to talking about the new hospital. I don't, I don't think it would be sensible to try and go into that tonight yeah. uh, because it's a fairly, it's a fairly big um, uh, issue and I think we'd probably like to see if we are going to be able to see anything that's um, sent out uh, uh, tomorrow or thereafter on this issue. Um, uh, we have monthly meetings as you know uh, many of which are already 
pretty much booked up, but this would be a priority for us. So yeah. perhaps offline we can um, speak and see where we can put this topic in for us to look at. Thank you. Yeah. So just in terms of tonight's agenda, what we'd just like to highlight is that after many years of trying to get a new hospital for the people of Hillingdon, what's happened is we've made huge strides uh, over the recent months. This has been achieved by working together very much as a health and care system. And we have become one of the forerunners uh, in terms of the NHS health infrastructure plan. And with the expect expectation that our scheme will be one of the first completed and we are aiming to achieve it by 2025. To ensure this happens, it is vital that we keep up this momentum with no holdups so that the window of opportunity that we currently have is not lost. Given the current state of the hospital, with over four fifths of the hospital requiring major repair or replacement soon, it is really important that we deliver this scheme and that we do it quickly and not all partners are committed to this. What I'd like to do now, Chair, is just to hand over to Ian to talk about our vision for the hospital and the process we have been through to date. Thanks, Jason. Can you all hear me? Um, so from its very inception, the CCG has built close relationships with the hospital um, and we are very keen to extend this much further. We've got an exciting vision for the hospital as part of an integrated local health and care system. And, and while it's important to understand that the range of services offered um, and the location the hospital won't be changing and therefore there'll be no substantial variation to the services, the way that we deliver the services will be modernised significantly. Um, and the COVID crisis has actually accelerated this um, as our meeting today is showing. So working closely with the major stakeholders, the GPs, the community, social care, and particularly the hospital, uh, we'll be moving from a sort of 20th century hospital centric model to a whole system holistic approach with joined up pathways for care delivery, which will make it much more convenient for patients. Because one of our key um, fundamental um, ideas and motives for the CTG is to provide care uh, at, a, at the most convenient place for the patient to be and also to only keep patients in hospital for the minimum amount of time necessary. So um, we've been making good progress um, in some of our services. In particular, we're running uh, children's clinics in many of the GP surgeries, which um, the families have found extremely um, helpful uh, and beneficial and, uh, and more convenient and actually quicker uh, to be seen. Um, in the emergency care area, we've made measurable improvements on same day hospital based emergency care, avoiding unnecessary hospital admissions. Um, and we've been working up uh, much more uh, lean uh, discharge processes, doing more of the planning with the patients in the community, working with uh, not just the hospital staff, but community and primary care. Um, and following the starting up of business as usual in the NHS and to help deal with the backlog of patients, um, we've been working with the consultants in a, what we call the advice and guidance capacity so that the, the, the consultants are seeing all the referrals um, and triaging uh, them as appropriate, uh, which will avoid about 40% of them coming to the hospital unnecessarily because we can do that work in the community. Um, so not only that, but, but the hospital um, is also working with its neighbouring hospitals, not just uh, London Northwest, but all the other acute hospitals to uh, set up a more efficient elective care process so we can again deal with the backlog of patients in a more effective way. Um, and the hospital is waiting uh, final approval from the Treasury on its business case um, for an electronic patient record, um, which will again uh, make care much better, slicker, efficient, and also uh, will facilitate the sharing of records between uh, hospitals um, and uh, a quicker throughput um, of these uh, 
patients. And in addition, once that's set up, the patients will be able to have those records um, accessible to them on their own computers or smartphones. Um, we're also hoping that with the new plans of the hospital, there'll be space that can be freed up to allow um, other health and social care partners to provide integrated services on the site. And we're very keen to explore these opportunities um, during the outline business case stage. Um, we've worked very carefully with all our partners, um, not just in the borough, but uh, across northwest London, um, and also uh, with the governors and patients. And we're going to carry on doing that. Um, as you're probably aware from the papers you've read, um, there were various options. Um, and in the end, uh, we had to decide between two strong options for redevelopment, either building on the existing Hiddington Hospital site or building on the Brunel University site, which is fundamentally over the road. Um, both options scored well on quality, um, but following uh, a very detailed assessment process, um, it was decided that new build on the Hiddington Hospital site was identified as the preferred way forward, primarily because it could be delivered three years earlier than um, any build on the Brunel site and also at a lower capital cost. Um, however, just because we're building it on the old Hillington Hospital site doesn't mean to say that uh, we won't be carrying on uh, extending our uh, links with Brunel. And as you know, Brunel is hoping to open up a medical school um, next year and already has a, um, a health campus. And we are uh, extending the opportunities to make bridges between the university um, which will be over the road and uh, other uh, care units that may be uh, keen to work with us. So I'll pass back to Jason now. Thank, Thank you, you, Ian. Uh, so to conclude, Chair, our preferred way forward is achievable by 2025. Uh, it will deliver against all the investment objectives that we have set and it creates space for other health and social care services on site and can be delivered whilst maintaining the delivery of existing services and minimizing disruption to patients. Our trust board at Hillington Hospitals uh, approved the submission of the draft strategic outline case to our regulators, which are NHS England and NHS Improvement in July 2020. And we're going through a process of that being finalized in discussion with the regulators and we'll be looking to then publish the full strategic outline case in October 2020. Prior to us moving on to that next stage with NHS uh, EI, the regulators will require confirmation that the requirement for formal public consultation has not been triggered. We have been working on this assumption as there is no substantial variation to services proposed and our service plans are in line with the NHS long-term plan and our Northwest London strategy. Although we recognize that this is a decision for this committee. We are planning extensive engagement with the public and staff on the trust plans and we will involve them alongside the committee and other interested parties in many aspects of the proposal in, in, as we work up the design. We have discussed our plans uh, for engagement with Health Watch, and we broadly uh, have got really good feedback on that side. And in conclusion, with the committee, we very much want to take forward our plans in partnership. So if it's okay now, we will pause there and, and chair over, over to questions if that's okay. I didn't know if um, Neil wanted to add anything. You said he might want to earlier on. So just in context for everybody uh, at the committee, Sir Neil Mackay has been brought onto the project very much to be able to, be, to provide external expert assurance that what we're doing is following all due process in terms of all the Treasury guidance and everything, but to make sure that very much as a system, we're taking this project forward together. Uh, so if Neil is there, he may want to add a few words. Thank you, Chair. Well, he certainly was there. I don't know if, if yeah. he's gone or... 
He might have a bit of a technology lag. I know it's, it's not Australia, but he, he's a few miles away. So we, we, oh, I see. we might what? just have a little bit of a lag. What, you mean like Pinner or somewhere like that, possibly? I don't know. More north than that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Well, maybe, maybe we can come back to that. All right. Um, okay. Questions? Anyone? from the committee or any I'd other? Like, I'd like to ask a question, Chairman, if that's okay. Councillor Nick Dennis, yes. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much for the presentation and coming to um, speak to us about this, because obviously, uh, as everyone is very well aware, um, hospitals are major, major big deals for local communities. And um, though obviously it's an official consultation isn't needed because the services that will be provided are basically the same, though obviously in a lot better way, hopefully. Um, you do anything with a hospital and the community has to be involved because, uh, you know, hospitals and, and health services are so important for local communities. So I've had a look at the engagement plan and it looks very thorough and you're speaking to lots of people on a regular basis, which is very, very good. Um, but I've just got a couple of questions around, um, around it. First of all, um, how is the feedback going to be recorded? Uh, how will that be communicated publicly because one of the things when you do consultations is people want to know at least they've been listened to even if they haven't necessarily been agreed with uh, and also um how will views be fed back to those decision makers because you know you don't you don't want necessarily need to have people agreeing with you of course but but if let's say as a committee we had come up with some ideas and you know we we want to at least be rejected properly shall i say so th those are my three questions around this sort of engagement program Thank you, Chair. Is it all right if I had Sarah? Do you want to start and then we'll add to that? Is that OK? Yes, of course, that's fine. Um, so I think with I completely agree with you. I think my um, it's an absolute priority that any engagement we do is not only thorough, but it's absolutely not just a tick box exercise. Um, so we've been quite quite clear that with our feedback um, we will have a very very clear process for capturing all of that feedback both um, from uh, conversations that we're having but also the survey that we're doing the plan is that we will have uh, a regular newsletter going out to those who are signing up to it and our stakeholders um, and that will include uh, the kind of the themes of the feedback that we're getting uh, that will also go onto our website but not only that we will sort of say it will be the you said we did so this is the feedback that we've heard this is how it's helping to shape our plans um, and this is sort of what we're going to do about it next so that could be uh, shaping the plans in terms of uh, the actual uh, the process itself. It could be shaping uh, how we do our engagement and what we go and talk to people about. It could be shaping the actual build itself. There's going to be various stages. It's going to change as we go throughout um, so that we are constantly engaging on the most relevant parts of the plan and we are bringing people in um, many, many stages. Um, the other point I just bring in here is we are looking to um, bring in more patient partners, so the lay partner side of things, to work alongside our clinical working groups. Um, and part of what we will do when we meet with them is say, this is all the feedback, this is how we've used it, this is how it's helped shape the plans, do you feel that we've used it right? So that there's a little bit more um, interrogation of our process there. Um, and obviously that's something that I would imagine we'd bring back to, to this committee quite really as well to make sure you're all, all content. All right, thank you. Um, can I just uh, suggest, uh, as Councillor Dennis has just done, that we um, stick to uh, uh, general questions of principle rather than any uh, matters of detail. We're at a very early stage at the moment, and I know that the team are going to be very keen to bring issues to us that will need us to drill down into detail. But for the moment, we'll, 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 we'll deal with general principles and any uh, queries that people have got. I, I've had an indication from Councillor Nelson, please. Uh, Councillor Avery, I also have some questions when you're ready, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. It's good to see this um, this um, build of Healing and Hospital on the agenda and seeing some progress for our community. It is long and well overdue. And as you put it forward, that we it's just um, questions. One of the questions I want to ask is about the variation of service that was proposed. Would that have an impact on the local community and how will that impact the local community with the variations of the services being provided? If it so happened that Hillingdon Hospital will be the preferred site, how will the two integrate together? Um, that's a question I would like to ask on that. 
And the other one was on consultation on item six, but it, the question has been um, answered by the, the speakers on that one. All right, thank you very much. Jason? Thank you, Chair. So, yes, but the consultation, can I just ask on the sort of previous piece around the variation, just, can you just clarify what you'd, you'd like us to answer for apologies? Yeah, I mean the variation of when if you're going to do start the build, how is it going to integrate with the present uh, building that is there? Because there will be some variation if it do goes on the Hill and Dunn Hospital side, um, it's maintaining the service that we have alongside the building work that is going on. How will that variation be? That's my question on that because it definitely will impact on the community and just to see how that will help to alleviate the community and give the community reassurance that even though it's, it, it, it's welcome, how they will live with it. That, that is my reason for the variation. Thank you, Councillor. Is it okay, Chair, if I just pass over to Tahir? Yes, of course. Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Jason. And thank you, Councillor Nelson. Um, in terms of the operations of the hospital while we, while we proceed with the new development, we have already put in place um, the beginnings of a, a very detailed decant and enabling strategy. The primary purpose of that strategy is twofold. First of all, we're not going to stop improving the hospital just because we're building a new hospital. So there's an agenda to keep on improving what we have. The second part of that is by undertaking that improvement, we are by default enabling those rather dilapidated facilities to be relocated to more improved environmental uh, surroundings, a better uh, temporary decamp facility is what we're referring to. And consequently, that enables the western side of the site to be freed up for the future development of the hospital. So in all intents and purposes, this will absolutely not diminish any of the existing services delivered from the hospital as they are currently delivered. Rather, in the short term, whilst we build a hospital, it will actually improve some of those facilities and the hospital will remain fully operational while we do that. All right, thank you. Uh, Councillor Lavery. Uh, the, <coughs> thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I too um, totally welcome this development. Um, it is long overdue um, to have a hospital that four fifths of it requires replacement. Um, clearly emphasises the case. Uh, the hospital is setting itself a very ambitious uh, target to get this all done from sort of concept stage to actually built in five years um, whilst doing it on the same site. A um, couple of questions, one around, around the process and another around, around, around services, if I might. Um, you... You're indicating that you believe you can continue to operate the hospital whilst building. Have you really explored that or do you need to decant some of your services off that site to make it work? Because builders, together with hospitals and patients, don't mix as a, a, as a group very well. Um, and also it can considerably increase the cost of your build if the builders are having to constantly work around you. Um, so that's one one question. Have you considered, you know, in detail? And the second is, um, I, I I heard what the CCG said about modernising service delivery and all of those um, all of those things. What I didn't hear any great clarity on, and I think is the point that's missing, is the integration with health and social care, because. A lot of people, particularly the more elderly coming out of hospital, may well require further care in the community and social care. And that integration pathway, for want of everybody's best efforts, doesn't always work as it should. Um, and I wonder what opportunities are being taken to uh, look at the way that works and also can some of that be provided within the new site. All right, who's going to uh, take those questions? If it's all right, Chair, I'll, I'll start and then I'll hand over to, to here. All right. So just on the integration of health and social care, I mean, a very valid point made by the councillor. I, I think what we want to do and absolutely do in partnership is as we develop the outline business case, 
is to look about how the hospital site can develop in partnership with other providers. So there's very much an element of working with primary and community colleagues, but absolutely the point is well made about if you look at one of the key demographics about how we provide services in hospitals, it is around care of the elderly and, and putting in sort of probably more appropriate service models, both in terms of design, but also the physical infrastructure that we provide. So absolutely, the assurance there is as part of the outline business case process, we want to explore that with all our partners. Just on the other piece of have we really tested our uh, sort of plans around building a hospital on a current hospital site, I'll pass over to Tahir, who, who might well share previous experiences as well of some of his grey in his hair. So uh, over, over to Tahir. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Jason. And thank you, Councillor. In terms of that particular question around the buildability around an operating hospital, it is something the hospital looked at very early on in this process. Um, there's, we, we actually went out to a soft marketing uh, strategy to speak to a number of major hospital contractors. I won't name them today. However, they have provided some very in-depth, detailed, both construction and buildability advice. I myself have worked on major hospitals in central London where we've built um, slightly larger hospitals in close or closer proximity to an adjoining site as well. So the evidence and the precedence is absolutely there. I think what we need to understand is that as part of building a hospital, the design partners pre do pay a, a great deal of importance on not just hospitals, but the, the sort of societal benefits that both design and construction brings to the table as well. It's important that we deliver a hospital that is considerate to the to its neighbourhood and of course the, the joining hospital as well. We will be using schemes such as the constra uh, considerate contractor scheme. Um, these also look to, in addition to that, as a design team, we also look to invest in the local community as well. So what we will be stipulating as part of this is that any construction that takes place also does involve a labour force that is sourced locally. We do with the construction and design agenda, looked at how we can engage other partners, including schools, um, to look how we can um, show the benefits of developing in suburban locations or in city locations and how development can be sympathetic and also how it does support the future generation of we would like to see investment in new homegrown architects and engineers and look for that innovation in construction design of course all of this is underpinned by the requirements born about through an agreement with the local authorities about the hours of working the times of working and the methodology in which we work as well a lot of this is well trodden path and happens across the city on a number of occasions. So we're hoping to bring all of those benefits and learning to the table to see how we can yet take that to a, a another level up, if you may say so. I mean, look, what we're trying to build here is a, a modern, the, a building the best possible hospital that we can build for the community of Hillington here. And we will do everything within our limitations and power to to deliver a hospital that is fit for the community with the least amount of disruption both to the operations of the hospital and that of the wider Hillingdon community all right well, thank you oh. councillor neil, neil mckay here may i say something to the first point um raised by councillor lavery um you you can sir neil but um in fact we uh, would welcome the opportunity, your opportunity to speak uh, more broadly. Um, earlier on, Jason said you may have a few words I, in terms I'm of introduction. I, I lost my connection. I apologise. No, no, no. It's it's fine. It's fine. I, but you, I just could, you can do I, both at this point. <laughs> I just wanted to make uh, probably the point I would have made had I not been disconnected. This 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 development is a huge opportunity to modernise the hospital. But if that's all we think about, then we're missing the point because it's, it, it needs to be used as a catalyst to really enhance our ability to deliver care in different settings, integrated um, out of hospital services, integrated between NHS organisations, including primary care, integrated with social care, 
integrated with nursing home and residential, the residential home sector. And one of the things that uh, struck me in my fairly limited experience with this group so far is the broad mindedness of the clinicians involved in the process. The clinicians uh, can um, help or hinder a development like this, but they have clear views about the need to work differently. And what I'm encouraging is a, a discussion about how part of the site um, could also be used as, uh, you might call it a health and care campus, where primary care facilities might be available, you might provide a pharmacy, um, nursing home facilities, a dementia care centre, etc. We, we know there is space to do that, and it's not currently in our plans, but I don't see any reason why we shouldn't give that earnest consideration as well, because it fits perfectly with the overall strategy we want to adopt. Indeed, and, and uh, there's already been discussion outside of this committee in the wider uh, public when people began to realise what was happening about this being an opportunity for something really very special to take place, mm -hmm. yeah. um, which included those other services, primary care, dentistry, um, and the other issues that you've talked about, and indeed the ones that Councillor Lavery's talked about, which brings me back, and I said we wouldn't do detail, and we seem to be drifting a little bit into it, but which brings me back to the whole business about building on the current site and keeping certain aspects of services going. Because aiming for the sort of hospital that you want and that we want, and we're all on the same page, I can assure you of that, um, it just strikes some of us that that because, and some of us have had personal experience of the hospital, because if not all of it, then the vast majority of the buildings are not really fit for purpose. Why are uh, you continuing with the idea of keeping services going in buildings which we already know aren't fit for purpose? Why not just do a whole decamp? To another, to maybe to another site for the for the short term, and then you leave the site able to be a blank canvas and build from scratch. To hear, do you just want to update on how, in terms of the planning, you've worked through in terms of a phase way how the layout of the site can change around so that there there is that ability to to keep sort of progressing at pace, but with minimal disruption. Uh, yes, thank you, Jason, I can. I, in terms of the actual phase development, if we look to decant all the services and then look to build a hospital, then, then some of the modeling has suggested that this could take up to 11 to 13 years to do that. So the option of sort of decanting all of those services away um, commissioning a sort of temporary facility and then having to clear the site and build something there is, is probably going to take a little bit longer. What we are doing, as I mentioned earlier, is some of that more dilapidated estate is being get decanted into modern, um, te albeit temporary, but modular accommodation, um, which is uh, which is beyond the five years that we're expecting it to last. In, in today's technology, those facilities are actually more efficient and um, of a very sound construction that would far exceed the five or 10 year life expectancy. So what we are doing by, by default and by the enabling and decant strategy is actually removing our worst estate and the bits that are left. And again, I stress, we will continue to invest in the bits that we can invest in that, and improve those over the five year period in anticipation of the new hospital coming online relatively quickly thereafter. All, all right. Um, Abbas, just um, just to pick up on what Ian was saying in terms of the, um, the, the, the way in which the interaction with the clinicians has, uh, has been going and the, the sort of foresightedness of the clinicians. Could you want to chip in with that, please? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can, yeah. Okay, great. Um, so I think building on what Ian says, um, we have a number of um, clinical working groups um, for the sort of key portfolio services and essentially they've been looking at um, the clinical pathways and um, into and out of the hospital and also the clinical adjacencies because one of the things we know about the, the current hospital is that 
um, is that services that are, are complementary um, are actually very far apart in the hospital and diagnostics is a particular one. So clinicians have been working together really to make sure that um, you know the, the hospital, the, the adjacencies are correct, the clinical pathways are correct and, um, and also the opportunity to work with uh, the partners in, in, you know, in community care. I mean, we know that I think just picking up on what was said earlier about, you know, some of the, you know, that it doesn't seem, seem like some things are working. Um, in fact, um, I, I was looking at some figures earlier on today, and these are sort of pre-COVID, when staff do work together and there's coordination, that actually the number of um, medically optimised patients who were still in hospital um, went down from 230 to around 150 by working um, with, the, with the integrated models that Ian was talking about earlier. And we know that um, with same-day emergency care, that 30 to 40% of, uh, of patients who traditionally have been admitted to hospital can actually, with enhanced diagnostics, and that might be something we want to pick up on a bit, um, can actually have their care delivered in a more ambulatory um, uh, setting in the community or one of the community hubs that Ian was talking about. Um, so, I mean, finally, what I'd say is the, is the clinicians are, and it's not just the doctors, but actually the nurses, the pharmacists, the therapists have all been working together as part of the clinical cabinet. It's easy just to think that it's the doctors that have the say. But it's actually all multi-professionals are on the, the working groups in the cabinet, um, are actually embracing those uh, principles of change and actually seeing how the new hospital can help us not just deliver those, but actually accelerate them. All right, thank you. Um, a question. Okay, a question uh, to Ian, um, and maybe Caroline as well, in a sense. Well, uh, more than in a sense. Um, with the restructuring uh, of the CCGs uh, in terms of Northwest London, how has that impacted on the way in which you've been able to approach the whole hospital uh, rebuild situation, as opposed to it being more Hillingdon centric? Okay, so I'll kick off first, and Caroline can add to it. In, well, the moment it's had very, it's had very minimal impact at the moment, and in many ways, the way I see it is that Hillingdon um, is at a more advanced stage in the holistic and integrated approach with its hospitals and and other services, community social services, than all of the other seven CCGs in Northwest London. We've been at it longer. We've got better arrangements. And it's partly because of the coterminosity. There's a, there's a great deal of um, um, support um, from the local residents to go to local hospital. Uh, and we know that between 80 and 85 percent of residents will use the hospital, even with its shortcomings. Um, whereas in the rest of London, um, the residents will travel across uh, quite a few boroughs uh, for their treatments. So. We've got in place uh, this integrated programme where there are very good plans developed um, to work with the hospital and the rebuild, um, which we think means that with the um, re-engineering of the CCG, so there's one big CCG, we'll be, I'm hoping, uh, uh, that we'll be left relatively alone compared with the other CCGs where the the input will be great because they'll want to get their services more integrated. Um, there's also um, a great deal of support from the other CCGs and um, the other sectors to get the new hospital built uh, because what's co what COVID really showed us is that when we collaborate together and we were moving patients um, between hospitals in COVID very quickly and very effectively, we want to carry on that process um, for the benefit of the patients. Um, and, and so the sooner we get um, a state-of-the-art hospital, the, the sooner they would actually um, start moving patients back into Hillingdon from where they are. Um, so I see that the political changes around the CCGs as not being of material impact on what we want to do. Um, okay, Jason, you were nodding away there. Do you want to make a comment at all? 
Apologies, Chair, just playing with the microphone. So the, the other piece, just to give assurance to the committee, is uh, concerning, as Ian has said, at a Hillingdon level, I think we are very well positioned compared to the, the sort of other sort of seven CCGs uh, and how things are progressing there. So I think we've got a really good firm local base. The other key about how we've made huge strides is at a northwest London level, we've got what's called the integrated care system now. So that's how they're sort of describing the whole of northwest London. Absolutely behind us uh, and backing us to move at the pace that, uh, that we are proposing. Similarly with that, there is a, a sort of a London element as well and very much the mayor's office and sort of the other key sort of uh, London bodies are really supportive. So it's just to give uh, assurance to the committee that we're, we're cognizant on a number of levels we need to be engaging in some of the changes that are making. And what we're trying to do is really position it as a, as a position of strength because of how we are working as a local system. All right, thank you. Caroline, anything to add? Apologies, Chair, she might not be there. No, no, she is. I can see her. Oh, is she? Sorry. Her, li her lips are moving, but I can't hear what she's saying. I'm not sure if anybody else can. It's muted for us too, Chair. Okay. She's she's not on mute, but we can't hear her. Okay, Caroline, we can't hear you, but we can, we can see you talking, but we can't hear you. <laughs> All right. Um, Chair, may I ask a, a question? Yes, of course, Councillor Maiden. Thank you. Um, I, 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 I share the similar concern that I think others are, are muting that maybe the ambitious time frame um, for a very welcomed redevelopment of the hospital uh, and, and site um, constraints may mean that we're limiting the imagination of the growth and development of the range of services we could have at Hillington. And I, I suppose I'd like to have some more reassurance about the process in decision making when the options were put on the table um, that it wasn't just the, the time and the money that made the decision but actually what benefits uh, the more broader ambitions that we'd like to see the hospital deliver for the community um, and the second part for me is is equally not rushing that consultation stage uh, and ensuring that all views uh, and feedback are shared I, I totally agree with that but making sure that those that we are seeking the views from really represent the diversity um, and difference within our, our, our borough um, and, uh, and aren't just um, a, a small selection or even uh, just those most convenient to us when consulting. All right, thank you. Who's going to come in with that? Thank you, Chair. So if I start, so thank you, uh, Councillor. I mean, the, the, the main bit, just to assure you, in, in terms of the, the process about how things sort of developed uh, around how we were going to progress. The investment objectives and the stakeholder involvement was very much inclusive of pretty much all the main stakeholders in terms of what do we want from the hospital. So there were key investment criteria across a number of areas and how this process works is uh, from a central perspective, there's the Treasury who've got something that's called a green book and it's very prescriptive in how they see uh, major capital developments progressing and what they expect to see. The, the assurance we can give you, uh, you around that is our discussions with the main regulators and, and the, the people at the centre is they've seen a very thorough and robust process to date. Absolutely, I take on board your words because the challenge now as we develop the outline business case is to, to continue those discussions about how we're developing the service models, how we're working in partnership. But hopefully from the, from the previous discussions, by doing that in partnership with, with everybody, we will come up with a sort of 21st century model of working, which really will improve services for patients. The piece about the timelines, uh, absolutely. We're very cognizant of the, the timelines in, in terms of uh, uh, what we are setting for ourselves. The, the main piece that we would like to sort of keep you updated with is we're going to resource ourselves accordingly. 
So if we, if we look at the program management team that we have put in place, if we look at the external advisors, if we look at somebody of sort of uh, Sunil McKay's stature as, as one of our strategic advisors as well, what we are trying to do is get the best heads in the country working on our project so that we are able to move at that pace, but absolutely to keep you abreast on uh, how we're going with that and certainly on the outline business case. Sarah, Tim, and sorry, sorry. Tim, can I just add yeah. that I think it's important to say that when we're doing the planning, it's not just about bricks and mortars. There's been a lot of work actually that has been had by Abbas uh, around the clinical strategy that's going forward for the future around the hospital and the community. But this strategy actually is a living, evolving document um, that will feed into the plans for the new building. All right. Well, that, again, that, that, that may be something in terms of detail that we can come to later on. And I'd be very interested. And I know everybody else would be yeah. to, to be looking at that and hearing about that. Chair, I think, can I ask a quick follow up question, if, if I may? Who's that? Oh, um, uh, Councillor Bonalli. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, of course. Sorry. Uh, really sorry to interrupt, but it's, it's really key on this point. And I, I, I was pleased to hear um, earlier that, that, you know, the, the rebuild is, is more than just bricks and mortar, like you just said, uh, Ian, but it's also... A, a platform for change and a platform for a uh, new clinical strategy as well. And just to just to sort of build on on, on Council, I made this as point. Uh, I've seen the engagement plan and read the engagement plan and think it's pretty good. Uh, but one of the key things that you will know and we all know is that different parts of our community have different uh, experiences and journeys through the healthcare system and different uh, relationships with, with clinicians and, and with healthcare workers. And so I'd be really keen to hear uh, you may or may not have specific plans in terms of engagements, not just with local community, but subsections within that local community who may have different experiences. One of the example that comes to mind is I just read a BMJ report about how uh, black women who are pregnant uh, are, are much more likely uh, to survive uh, than when they're treated by other black doctors. And I think, you know, that that is a, a, a snapshot of, of one group uh, uh, of patients' experiences, but I think highlights the, the different... Uh, journeys uh, and outcomes that different groups have. So if there is any specific drive to make sure that the engagement and the, the consultation uh, reflects the diversity of our community in Hillingdon uh, and how that will shape the future clinical strategy as well as uh, even the physical building in itself. Thank you. So, uh, th thank you, yeah. Councillor Manali. Sarah, do you want to um, comment yes, on Yes, I was coming on um, uh, a few of those points. So just to give you a bit of an overview of what we're we're doing already so we're already um working with a number of the residents associations we've we've put out some information to them um and just starting to work in the days uh we're using the next door platform uh which a number of you might be familiar with sort of, um community sort of engagement and our citizen panel um and we're we're talking to a lot of the community groups just to talk about how we can um use them to reach out uh, and sort of the faith groups um and sort of some of the patient groups to start reaching out um i mean if there is <laughs> I sort of <laughs> hesitate to say this if there is to be a benefit of covid anywhere along the line that people are so much more familiar with um online platforms like like this uh like you know hangouts and zoom to to do meetings that it means that when we do our when we have uh lay partners um or we're sort of doing patient groups it's not the usual suspects and i don't mean that with any disrespect to sort of the people that we we do speak to quite a lot but it is not always representative there are people who can't make meetings uh in the middle of the day because they have their own um, their own work they can't um, maybe we need to do them in the evening or the daytime in uh, the weekend and this kind of forum is a lot easier to do that um, that said it also it, it brings its own challenges which is there's a lot of the traditional engagement which is harder to do um, engaging with those with <clears throat> certain uh, disabilities um, English maybe not as a first language uh, all these kind of things or people who just don't have the technology to be able to do this um, it, COVID is presenting those challenges for us to get out in the community in the way that we would like to. Um, I was actually talking about this with, with Healthwatch today uh, and we are we are coming up with a number of solutions which will mean that we can start to go out into the community a little bit more in a very COVID safe way and um, working with community leaders um, from a number of different uh, communities who can go out and speak to people in either their own language, um, perhaps in a setting that they feel more familiar with. If we are 
you know, to, to do effective engagement, I think, you know, I, I, I'm probably talking to the converted here, but to do effective engagement, we need to reach a bit of everybody um, across Hillingdon um, and be sort of shaping our plans based on what everyone is hearing us. And it's it's not just, um, it's not a weight of opinion. So it, it's not, well, 90% of people have said this, we'll do this. It's about listening to all the different bits of engagement um, and feedback that we, we get. Um, and I would very much welcome any feedback from uh, councillors or either as a group or individually of particular networks that maybe you are involved in um, or communities that you you know of to help us reach out to those those groups at this point. I was just going to uh, mention that uh, that um, uh, we all we're all pretty much on the same page as far as the um, engagement is concerned uh, and way past the point of consultation in the in the traditional sense I think but nevertheless um, I think that there's uh, some powerful and useful connections that uh, that we will have that others that we know will have and and the sort of uh, further reach that we will have um, so when the time comes and you're looking for uh, specific ideas as to groups and organizations and natures and types of people and that sort of thing then um we, we, we'd be happy to uh, come forward with those sorts of issues all right um councillor lavery please uh, thank you chairman um if i could just say on the engagement we absolutely do need to engage as widely as possible so we hear as many views as possible um i've done a lot of stuff over the last several months on um, various technology platforms and i'm very familiar with them they can be very good, but equally not everybody has the same access. And I don't just mean you may not, you may or may not have a computer, people's confidence with them, people's ability to use them, even people's strength of connection, internet connections um, can be difficult. So um, I think we do need a little care. Professionals have got very used to using them um, because you've had no choice. Um, but in the wider community, certainly in meetings I'm, I'm doing sometimes, um, not everyone is is as comfortable doing it um, as 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 others. You know that means it doesn't mean they haven't got perfectly valid views. So uh, that may well be a challenge you'll need to work into your into your plans. Um, that was just a comment on that and a caution, if I might, um, to, to, just to ensure we don't go down the technology trap. Um, could I ask a slightly wider point while I've got chairman? While I while absolutely, I'm... of course you can. Yes, yes, yes. Um, two things that i think clearly at the moment you're looking at your outline business case and clearly um the provision of what services go on the site and uh, i'm pleased to hear the various comments about engaging but also looking at wider service delivery and how we might get the integrated piece to work better um i am presuming and i do have another hat on with this but i am presuming um, that you once you begin to look at what your hospital site might look like and various phases of this and various buildings you'll need that you will take early engagement with Hillingdon's planners um, because that I'm not saying in case of Hillingdon Hospital in particular but in case of certain it isn't always the case that that happens and sometimes you end up with delays and problems that could have been alleviated had you had early conversations. I'd be looking for some reassurance that you'll be, once you begin to get past the, um, once you get into your design phase of buildings, you're beginning to talk with planners to understand what in planning terms is likely to be acceptable and likely to be acceptable to the community that surrounds that hospital, because it is a very heavily built up area and the, the communities that surround hospitals will have to use as well. And while you're doing that, you might explore a wider point. Uh, I was pleased, I think the Chief Exec, or the Acting Chief Exec said you've got a great support from the Mayor's Office, which I was glad to hear. Um, you might also um, be looking to do some leverage with our friends at Transport for London, because the links to this site, certainly by public transport, slightly better with the new 278 bus, but are not perfect by a long way. Um, it isn't the easiest site to reach if you have to reach it by public transport. And if there is wide support, it might well be worth engaging at an early stage with Transport for London to see if things can be done to improve certainly the bus services um, that head in that direction. 
All right, thank you. To here or Jason or anyone? <laughs> Jason, shall I take that? Uh, thank you, Councillor. In terms of the um, I'll do it in reverse. In terms of the transport links, um, you'll be pleased to know that we have already had engagement with Transport for London. We are also engaging with the local authorities as part of a joint travel plan and a green plan for the engagement of not just now, but for the future of the development as well. Um, we have on, on early iterations proposed a significantly enhanced bus connection within the confines of the hospital which will not only provide improved bus service but will actually provide good pedestrian access from that bus route into the hospital as well so those are something that we're absolutely behind and endorse as part of our wider sustainability and travel plan as well in relation to the first question about engagement with the planning authority, again, we have already had significant input and engagement with the Hillingdon Planning Authority. Um, we are at our present with our planning consultant Savills shaping what would be a PPA, a, a, a planning performance agreement. Um, and we're at the, the sort of the, the final knockings of what that might look like. But as, of course, as we as we gear up with more intelligence, we will be, we'll be shaping that to more fit for purpose going into the future. We have already throughout the strategic outline place also engaged um, professional travel and, and um, uh, transport consultancy as well. And we'll keep that continuity throughout the OBC going forward. So there's quite a lot of engagement on the, on the transport and sustainability side. All right, thank you. Um, I'll take one last question because we've been dealing with this topic for quite some time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, I did see Simon's hand and Nikki's re-reminded re me that um, Simon, uh, Councillor Arnold was waiting for quite some time. So I'll, I'll uh, uh, take Councillor Arnold's question, please. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Um, and I'm delighted to hear about the ambition to complete this project within five years. Um, my question is, is what fears do you have that may make the project slip? And uh, more importantly, how can the council and this committee help to make sure that that doesn't happen? All right, um, Jason? Yes, so if, so if, I, if I'm honest and reflective of sort of previous iterations of uh, the attempts to get a new Hillingdon Hospital, I think there were two sort of significant risks previously. One of them, if, if we're honest with ourselves at the hospital side, the, the project and the programs uh, have been probably resourced more like a cottage industry than really sort of uh, a, a really slick outfit that, that are gonna go for this. Uh, and, and the second one is, I think there was probably uh, reflections uh, previously that we, were, we weren't maybe as well joined up locally as we should have been in all coming together to say we want a local hospital um i was very cognizant of that last year i think what we've done in terms of securing the funding to make sure that we're appropriately resourced over the next five years to be able to deliver to the time scales that we're outlining the assurance i can give uh, councillors today is that we we are as it sort of stands we are getting funding from the centre to be able to resource ourselves appropriately. And I think that's probably the first time it's really happened uh, to the extent required uh, for us at Hillingdon. So I think that has been a real big development this time. Um, the, the other piece is, which again, uh, hopefully uh, I'll look to faces uh, to concur. I think genuinely this time is all the system partners, both locally and in Northwest London, are really behind us this time. And I think whilst we're sort of obviously going through an outline business case, there will be a number of areas that we need to sort of further develop together. I think we tangibly have something here about everybody wanting a new hospital and working together on it jointly. Uh, and I hope that part of the testament of that is the presentation today is between Ian at the CCG and ourselves at the hospital to show how we are really joined up this time. And absolutely, in terms of what Councillor Lavery said previously, really joined up with the local authority, the planning department, because all of these 
sort of issues previously, I think have sort of been highlighted as weaknesses. And I think this time is a real strength. All right, thank you. As I said, we've been at this for uh, some time and we've covered a, a, a lot of ground, which I'm very pleased about. Um, however, there is one last thing. Um, I think that from listening to everybody and also speaking to pretty much all my colleagues on the committee, uh, we are all on the same page. And it, essentially the two questions that you ask, uh, uh, do you agree we need a new hospital and um, can you help, uh, is yes to both. Uh, as far as um, help the committee can uh, give and what how we take that forward, we have a meeting every month. And although we will not necessarily have um, a rolling topic of the hospital, at any stage, um, and I'm sure everybody else or, or my colleagues agree, at any stage, if you need to bring something to us or just want to bring something to us, then you can, either at the regular meetings or we're perfectly happy to try and put together and I'm looking at Nikki for her to chuck something at me, um, uh, at meetings outside our regular pattern, because this is so important to us. Uh, you know, uh, your, uh, Jason and your team, um, about how things are now, but uh, many of us have been waiting over 20 years for this to happen. So the support is there in, in great numbers, to the extent that I think it's worthwhile and Nikki can you press the button please um, what we've decided to do is to build into our minutes um, a, a comment from the committee which Nikki has emailed to everybody now well at least to all the committee members and I'll read it to you it's a short paragraph because I think it's important for us to express on behalf of the committee the strength of feeling that we have in regard to those two questions so um, what, what it reads is this, on behalf of our residents, the London Borough of Hillingdon External Services Select Committee warmly welcomes the progress made so far in seeking to achieve a new build of Hillingdon Hospital. We wholeheartedly endorse the need for a new hospital given the long desire of residents and the council for a new hospital to be built. Our residents and other users deserve nothing less. The committee looks forward to being able to provide a strongly supportive and constructively critical role at every stage of the process and development of what we envisage will be a state-of-the-art hospital facility to serve our residents and the wider community for the long-term future. Um, I think uh, it would be helpful if we were able to put that into our minutes and I, I see no dissent from any of my colleagues I think it would be a good idea for that to be, uh, uh, as it were, a statement of our support uh, for this project. Unless anyone wants to demure from that, and I see that nobody does, we'll put that in the minutes. I'm very grateful. All right, Jason, um, to you and to all your colleagues, thank you very much. I'm sure we will get used to seeing you all uh, in the future as you bring things to us. Um, interested Abbas in the in the clinical side and and what how you've developed things and also you Ian as well so no doubt we'll hear about that in more detail as time goes on but uh, that's been incredibly useful for us and we look forward to speaking to you in the future thanks thank you thank you all right we will um, move on now to the next item, which is item uh, agenda item number seven, um, which is uh, our uh, report in regard to um, our police services and um, Safer Hellington Partnership. I know that Jackie's here and uh, others. So who's going to start with that? I will, if you like, Councillor Riley. Thank you, thank you. Uh, good evening. So you will have seen a report, um, the Safety Hillington Partnership Performance Report, which represents a summary of the performance highlights um, using data for Q1 of this um, year, which is 2020-21, um, covering the period April to June. A couple of things that are worthy of um, note that firstly, at the time the targets were being set for this year, 
um, it was difficult to judge what the impact would be of the pandemic on the crime rate. Um, and so therefore the targets um, from 1920 um, have been rolled forward into 2020-21. And these will be um, reviewed throughout the year. That's the first thing. Um, and a couple of key messages to come out also are that um, with a couple of exceptions, such as domestic abuse and antisocial behaviour, crime rates uh, reduced or were reduced at the height of the pandemic. What we're starting to see now is that there's been an increase in crime rates, which were um, have come from a low base and they're now starting to creep up to pre-COVID levels. And I'll just take you through um, a couple where we're seeing um, some reductions, and I'm sure Richard Watkinson will um, highlight these as well, but in respect of burglary, for Q1, um, we saw 289 residential burglaries reported, which is below the quarterly target of 456. And that was less than Q4, which had an outturn of 446. So that saw a decrease of 35.2%. We also saw a reduction in non-residential burglaries for Q1, um, which was 98 compared with Q4, 122, which represented a 19.7 decrease. Um, we've also seen reductions in personal property robberies and knife crime with injury, um, which again, if you look at that particular target, stands at 21 for Q1, um, which is below the quarterly target of 28 and less than Q4, which had an outturn of 23. There were a couple of um, crimes which we have seen an increase in. Um, Antisocial behaviour at the beginning of the pandemic, so at the end of Q4, March, going into Q1, um, we saw there was a lowering of antisocial behaviour reports um, across the whole spectrum of offences. Possible cause of this may be that there was due to a limited number of people going out uh, and the fact that the hospitality sector was closed down. Uh, we also had social distancing was put into place as well as social bubbles, which led to social isolation. Um, in addition to that, there was a limiting of social interactions and places where groups could converge, um, leading to a lowering of reports. What we're seeing now, though, is these restrictions are starting to lift. We're seeing an increase, um, for example, um, where people are starting to use outdoor gym equipment and play areas. And we also saw an increase where perhaps because people were confined to their residential addresses, they were more aware of noise from um, neighbours. Another increase we saw was where people were reporting um, members of the public uh, for non-compliance of the government guidance relating to COVID. So those were the significant increases in relation to antisocial behaviour. With regard to domestic abuse, um, although there have been some peaks and troughs, all areas and services dealing with domestic abuse have shown an increase in reporting and again that has been more significant since the lockdown restrictions have been relaxed. Early on and, and prior to lockdown it was recognised by both our local domestic abuse steering executive, MOPAC and um, other strategic levels that domestic abuse and other associated forms of gender abuse such as honour-based violence, would increase during the pandemic. So what we did was we worked closely with the police and Crime Stoppers, and we ran a targeted campaign to raise awareness of domestic abuse. 
And this campaign ran from the 21st of May right through to, it was a six week period, uh, which ended on the 2nd of July. But we had two particular areas that we were focusing on, um, as well as signposting victims to um, different support mechanisms. But we focused on perpetrators because we wanted, we, we understood that victims would be in lockdown situations with perpetrators. So we wanted to get perpetrators to look at their behavior and the impact it would have on um, victims. And we also concentrated on bystanders. So that was empowering, if you like, members of the community to speak out if they saw or they heard domestic abuse. This campaign was delivered in a number of ways. We had digital billboards outside, um, for example, supermarkets, Tesco's and um, Sainsbury's. We delivered um, about 10,000 leaflets and there were also um, advertisements put on Facebook and Instagram advertising. We, um, in addition to that, we sent out a stakeholders briefing note, and we've done 10 so far, um, but they went out to all our key partners and agencies who were dealing with domestic abuse to keep in touch and keep everybody informed of what was going on and how we could support each other. I suppose the biggest thing it, um, is to let you know is that all our services that we commission, so that includes the refuge, um, HESIA that provide our floating um, support to low and medium um, risk victims and our IDVA service, which is the independent domestic violence advocates who provide advocacy support to the high risk victims. Um, and the Richmond Fellowship, who provides therapeutic services to children and families. All of these services were able to go about their business as usual, albeit these services were delivered uh, remotely. It hasn't been without its problems, and we are trying now um, to get back to more face-to-face -face services, but um, I suppose it is just to stress that these services have carried on throughout. Um, I don't know whether now you would like Richard to expand on some of the targets that I've mentioned, or whether you would like to ask any questions. Well, um, yeah, yes, uh, there is a question. Um, I think you said that the campaign as such began in May. I may have got that wrong. Um, but it seemed to me during the actual lockdown, a lot of um, charities took the opportunity to, um, and I mean this in, 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 in the sense it, that it's intended to sort of ram home their message about the um, need for um, concern in regard to their individual sectors. I just wonder, give, even given the constraints of people being able to work, and I mean um, yourselves and those involved in the, um, I prefer to call it abusive relationship sector, um, whether or not there was any thought to a kind of joined up um, process with other boroughs, other or other charities, London wide, to have a similar sort of push during the pandemic itself, because perhaps it, it would have been something that was foreseeable that abusive behaviour would have gone on the increase during the course of causing people to be locked up together. Yeah, um, certainly um, we work closely with Hestia. Hestia were our, um, a national um, organisation and they were providing a number of um, support services, for example, safe spaces in supermarkets and booths and places like that. Um, but that was really the purpose of this stakeholders briefing was to try and um, 
linking with all the different services working on the borough. Um, Refuge again is another um, national organization. Um, so we were working with closely with them. Um, and I say that information from the different different organizations was being disseminated out through the stakeholders briefing. But I, I was just wondering, and then if anybody else wants to come in, please do. Uh, but I was just wondering, given the fact that we seem to be having um, additional lockdowns in very localized areas, and I know it, that we haven't had any in London as such, lessons learned from the national lockdown in terms of domestic violence uh, are they being transported, if you like, into other communities where they are being locked down um, geographically or, or, or in regions so that the message is getting across more there? Um, Councillor, um, I think, oh, Chairman, I think what we can say confidently is that um, in, in Hillingdon we've drawn on um, the, the resources and the services, the commission services we have in place, um, working with the police, working with voluntary sector organisations to make sure that um, lessons learned from other parts of the country, but also our practice locally is joined up um, and responds to um, ca uh, referrals and case inquiries in, in a very coordinated way. So, so for example, um, one of the things we have in place locally is our domestic abuse um, MARAC or multi-agency risk assessment um, committee and what that means is is that um, that we um, are able to work together as a partnership to review um, and assess uh, particular cases and make sure that there is an agreed response to those cases so whether it be that referral pathways come through the police or social care or um, some other setting, um, there is a consistent response. And that draws on the best practice um, that's established across police forces and local authorities up and down the country. I think, um, I think the challenge though for, for, all, uh, for all areas during the, 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 the pandemic has been the increase in demand. And we um, have, I feel, managed that well um, in the borough, working with housing colleagues, working with the police. Um, and it, it has been, um, some, of the, some of the examples that Jackie and the team and others have given to me um, um, have, have, have been heartwarming in that um, we, you know, we've, joined, we've joined up uh, resources and, and our effort to make sure that victims and their families have been protected and been safeguarded. And when necessary, that um, perpetrators have been, um, have, have left the family home and that family home has had additional protective measures through sanctuary scheme and others put in place again it's all drawing on the on best and recognized practice for for victims but we, we don't i suppose we're confident but never complacent no 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 I, I i i agree um what i was thinking about was jackie was saying about raising awareness and empowering others to um to spot signs and so forth and and um experience shows that there are certain types of behavior certain signs certain ways of um of victims of abuse behaving that can be spotted by others and i was very struck as i say during the pandemic about the extraordinary upsurge or maybe not extraordinary maybe it was entirely to be expect, uh, ex expected of of various charities pushing their message and and you know nspcc and everything from animal charities to everything food charities and i just wondered if and i know we can't do it on our own in hillington that would be crazy but whether or not there there was a there were there would be any idea because this is not going to suddenly stop of yeah. utilizing um a, a, a cross charity and cross borough funding for a tv campaign um about uh, domestic violence and, and about awareness and about signs to look out for so that you could almost have a direct appeal to friends and family or neighbours if you see this sort of thing happening don't be afraid to to, to call it out or, or to report it that's I was just thinking about that sort because it was very clear that other charities were having a really big bash um, at the public <laughs> through the pandemic because they had a captive audience yeah no, absolutely that's a good point 
I think, um, Councillor Riley, the other thing that I would like to say is that at the moment uh, we are still um, going through this lockdown pandemic um, scenario. So we don't fully know what the full extent is um, and what the effect is. But I chair the um, Prevention and Engagement subgroup, which sits under the Domestic Abuse Steering Executive. Um, and one of the pieces of work that we are doing is to um, speak to all our partners and, and various agencies who have been dealing with domestic abuse on the local level to try and pull together um, good practice and lessons learned um, so that we can take this forward. Um, but that's a piece of work in progress at the moment. All right, thank you. Um... Let me turn to um, Inspector Watkinson, um, if you want to comment on this particular aspect and then help us with some of the targets and so forth. Hi, good evening, Edwin. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm phoning in because the um, police technology doesn't seem to like Google, probably because of the bills involved. So if there's any queries, I can't see eyebrows raised. Please interrupt. Um, in terms of domestic abuse, um, I'm really pleased. We are, uh, the levels are much lower than we expected. Um, I mean, no domestic abuse is acceptable, but we have not seen a rash, massive increase of, of domestic abuse reports. And that's partly because we've worked, been working with the council throughout the pandemic, pandemic to try and identify potential victims. And we've been making visits to areas and, and, and um, houses where we know abuse occurs during the pandemic um, to intercede and offer support, but not only in terms of marked uh, visible police officers, but also our IDVADs, our plainclothes independent uh, domestic violence advisors, to try and um, give victims a chance of a bit of connectivity and a bit of a chance to speak to the police away from the aggressors. So it, it's my big fear before the pandemic, and I'm sure Jack Mr. Kennedy, too, was that we would have a huge surge of quite serious assaults on, on predominantly women. And, and at the moment, once the figures have increased, we haven't seen that. Um, and that's been um, rectified, that's been um, mirrored across London, and partly because uh, there's a lot of the work that the council and the police have managed to put in um, to try and redress the problem. That's one of the issues with um, COVID. Um, COVID caused us several issues, and, and, and Jacqueline Robertson has already covered some of the, the facts and the figures for you. Um, but in terms of meeting our Safe Hennenden Partnership, aims were certainly down on, on burglary. We're looking at the moment, as of the 31st of August, we're down by 5%. Robbery, we're down by 20%. Violence is up by 2%. And, and weapons, the carrying of knives, is up by 30%. But to reassure you, a lot of the knife offences we have are obviously ones that we discover when we stop and search people, we find them carrying a knife. Um, and that's the same for the burglary issue. It's, it's very difficult to burgle a house when there's someone already in it. And it's very difficult to rob someone when there's very few people on the streets. And if you're dealing drugs on the streets, it becomes very, very obvious and evident that you are hanging around where you shouldn't be. And Jacqueline mentioned that an increase in ASB is actually almost doubled um, over the COVID period. But the large percentage of those extra ASB calls are, as she confirmed, effectively neighbours either noticing things about the neighbours they don't like because they're in house 24-7, or actually a huge amount of reports on, on neighbours who were maybe out longer than they should have been during the pandemic, or having a barbecue in a back garden, and the, the next door neighbour was happy and thought five people were present when there should have only been two. Um, and I challenge anyone to be exactly cognizant of the, uh, the changing uh, COVID regulations as we went through the several months. Um, but what we haven't seen is an increase in genuine um, effect in the community ASB. Um, and that's been, again, quite a, um, quite a, a pleasing um, effect. What will happen what, now the schools go back to normal and we get back to normality? Um, again, I don't know. Um, just like domestic abuse, I'm hoping that when we go back to school, we won't have a rash of, of children who are either not coming back to education or have suffered in silence during the COVID. Um, but we've put in the plan to have our schools officers visiting every school over the next couple of weeks to, to sort of identify at-risk pupils and put in any, any help we can. Um, and we've made a lot of effort um, to identify and speak to offenders. The, the Met brought in very clever schemes 
uh, I thought, and, and we were not often good at bringing in clever schemes, but they did, um, to try and speak to offenders during lockdown who weren't offending because they couldn't and offer them ways out of offending. Um, I suggested we should furlough offenders just as we furloughed um, employed people. We should pay offenders not to offend. And that wasn't taken up, but we had visited them and offered them ways out of offending. Um, and I think 20... Uh, roughly 20 high-ranking offenders per borough have been visited. Um, it's a long-term project, so I've got, no, um, I've got no figures for you, but approximately 20% of the people we visited throughout the Met have shown some interest in actually getting on a non-offending scheme. Um, and if that reduces it, I mean, we're talking about prolific offenders who will commit the majority of our offences throughout London and affect our communities. And if that works, and it, it, the proof is in the, um, the time taken to to carry it on but if that works that will have a genuine effect long term across London in driving down crime and is that something that the that the police and probation are involved in because obviously probation would have um, quite a reasonable handle on numbers and individuals who they would have been um, looking after or uh, supervising before the uh, pandemic and before the lockdown. Uh, uh, what efforts are you making to link up with them to see if you can take advantage of the resource that they that they will have? Well, all the time, again, as, as Ben Kennedy mentioned, we have the, um, the merit meetings, and they are meetings when we focus on high-risk individuals with an input from, from everyone, including probation, health services, social services, the local council, um, so we can identify and manage our high-risk individuals. The whole point of the meetings is to try and intervene before they go on to commit offences, or if they're released from prison, what we can do to put in a, a support network, if you like, um, to stop them going back to a, to a life of crime. All right. Um, any of my colleagues got any questions, want to raise their hands for any specific issues at the moment? Councillor Mathers, was that a, an indication or? If, if I may, Chair, um, I just have a question because uh, I may have missed something. In the um, hate crimes with disability, domestic abuse, faith hate crime, transgender hate crime, I'm just wondering which of those categories or if there's an additional category for um, one's based on race or ethnicity um, and what the statistics are in that line. Um, that's on the, the scorecard. Sorry, can, can you repeat that? Um, on the, uh, it may be a question for, for um, Jackie or, or Dan, on the um, Safer uh, Healing to Partnership scorecard, I can't see where it would identify the statistics for um, uh, hate crimes in regards to ethnicity or um, race. Um, Councillor, we'll have to um, get back to you on that one. It's not actually listed on our on our scorecard. Thank you. Uh, sorry, if I'm coming. I mean, if it helps, um, the the level of hate crime across. West London, actually, the whole BCU, uh, both in Hillingdon and Hounslow and Ealing, is exceptionally low, certainly compared to the rest of London. I, th I think we run probably on about one or two hate crimes per day um, across Hillingdon. And obviously, one, you know, one or two is, is, still ex is more than we should have. Um, but we, we seem to be a very united borough, um, and we don't have a lot of the the issues that the other boroughs in, in other parts of London face. All right, thank you. Councillor Lavery, please. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, obviously, these are, in some respects, um, slightly strange statistics because they cover, obviously, a period where we were, we were under lockdown and therefore there is some you know, definite skewing of the numbers as... as um, People have pointed out it is difficult to burgle places where everybody is and clearly if there's less people on the street, there's less people likely uh, to get themselves into difficulties. Um, I think the, the work around domestic violence is to be commended, um, but I think it will be important for that to be maintained um, going forward because, as, as Councillor Riley said, we may go in and out of these lockdown situations and the cumulative effect of them on people um, could cause a spike. 
uh, as to those who may have been unable, despite all our best efforts, all the best efforts of partners, um, may have been unable to actually flag the situation to anyone. So hopefully everyone is alert for, uh, for that as it develops. Um, I was pleased to hear from the Chief Inspector that the school's officers uh, are being targeted to go to schools. Um, certainly from my work with schools, um, there is a concern that what may have been going on on social media and in other places, whilst all the pupils were on holiday, could now spill over into stuff um, that becomes real. So I'm, I'm glad to see that, that that engagement is going on and I would commend that and hope that it is, it is done right across the borough um, so that we don't end up with an upsurge um, in violent incidents and other incidents um, as we, as everyone comes back to normal. Uh, Dan, have you got any comments on the back of that or? Yeah, I mean, just to add that, um, I mean, we, we, the local authority work um, closely with the police, the, the school's officers, um, and through um, a, no, a number of programmes that that we commissioned, um, that we have commissioned, we're engaging with schools and school leaders are also, you know, head teachers, school leaders are also engaging really well and see this as an important um, agenda. I mean, everyone wants children to get back to school and start learning, you know, and 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 continue that learning and and wherever possible, try to get back to how things used to be pre pre COVID. So we all want the same thing. Um, obviously, there's, there's, there has to be some changes to the way we work, um, but nevertheless, we, we have to therefore use different communication channels, but continue to use existing communication channels to engage with um, with, with, with young people um, as well. So I'm pleased to say that we're in, that the, both the police and the local authority are in, and the school are all working well together to deliver those messages to young people, um, and we're, we're doing what we can um, when we can to, to make, make sure that, that that gets through. All right, thank you. Um, perhaps another question directly um, for the Chief Inspector. Um, we, we, we're very much aware over the recent past that there have been a number of changes in senior leadership uh, as far as Hillingdon and the uh, wider um, Triborough aspect is concerned. Uh, from your operational point of view, ha have there been any difficulties with the the, the various changes in terms of direction, in terms of the way in which um, messages and so forth are able to be got out to uh, uh, members of staff, to uh, officers on the ground and so forth. Has that been a problem at all? Councillor, I'm, I'm glad you asked that because I, mean, I just wanted to cover COVID off first. And, and Jacqueline sent through several questions um, previous to the meeting that I wanted to address. So the first one is, is no, in actual fact, because the directions are set by the commissioner. Uh, and, and what we do in Hillenden is set by yourselves as a council and the local authority um, and the commissioner and MOPAC. And we work to those. And in, in, an, in a sense, it matters not who leads the local organisation. Um, and, and that messaging comes from the centre. Now, uh, we have Chief Superintendent Gardner, um, who I say from a personal aspect, I think he's very, very good. Um, and he apologises for not being here because he's away. And I know we obviously had a movement in of senior leadership but unfortunately within a met that generally happens because what you find if if people are good and delivering good results and, and west area at the moment is on the top of several scorecards throughout the met then they will be moved on by the met hierarchy to go to other boroughs that may well be be struggling so the, the movement of leadership is, is often quite difficult um sorry it's not difficult it, it doesn't cause us difficulties but it is a regular thing um, but it doesn't necessarily lead to a drop in performance. Um, there, there are a couple of questions relating to Ealing and Helen and the Hounslow, and I know from from meeting all three local authorities that no one is particularly happy with the BCU approach, and, and that's one that's been foisted on us. But I can assure you that there is no um, layering or, or level of importance in terms of different authorities, and certainly Ealing are often asking for more police and, and shall we say more attention and, and likewise with Hounslow. Um, for Hillingdon itself, the number of officers we have based at Hillingdon have gone up over the past year um, and teams have increased in strength now. We have over 40 officers per team um, 
uh, on the five response teams that we have currently running out of, of Uxbridge, um, our fitness, and if you take that as a, a sign of morale, our fitness is generally, we're losing about 23 days sick a day um, at the moment. And, and in a year ago, we were losing 28 to 30 days fitness mm-hmm. a day. That excludes COVID sickness. Because the job decided that, obviously, if you've got COVID, we do not want you in. So we're not going to keep you in sick if you are off with COVID. Um, but very few officers are currently self-isolating. Uh, I think I have two safer neighbourhood officers at the moment who are working from home um, and doing a, a, sort of a relevant job. Um, so I assure you that we're not. Um, Pennington isn't uh, any less regarded by any of the people. Uh, on the borough. Um, and actual fact, two pieces of good news I wanted to, to, to bring in. Well, let's see, I'm going to bring in three pieces of good news. The first is, is the COVID really highlighted the importance of working with you as a local authority. And we've had some great successes working up in Northwood um, with Jacqueline's team and that social behaviour team and the child protection team. And we've replicated that in West Drayton, where we've had an upsurge in violence. And it's really important to work with the local authority teams on the ground because they know the houses and they know the faces. And sometimes we, we miss that information. Um, I know that recently the, the size of the funded team has been reduced, and, and that's no to criticism of local authority. The Met um, dropped the buy one, get one free scheme, so it's the same amount of money you get less police officers. But from the end of September, the neighbourhood tasking team um, actually exists. And I've talked about it, and Mr. Gardner has talked about it for a while, but it actually starts at the end of September. So there will be a group of one and six officers who will specifically police Hillingdon and can be assigned and tasked by me to problem areas and some problem solving. Um, and our wards are going to get on attachment some additional officers, some new probationers coming in, will be attached. And that's courtesy of, of my horsehorn, my superintendent. Um, for six months, they will bolster a ward. Now, that's not a permanent increase, but it is for six months an increase of officers and an increase of visibility. Um, it can and dry, hope to continue driving down the fending. We are facing a few challenges. Um, and, and recently, if you've noticed, this weekend, last week, and at the height of the Black Lives Matter protests, are the first times in current history I can remember where the Met has said that we can abstract funded officers and dedicated ward officers who normally cannot leave their ward uh, can, according to the hierarchy for the Met, be taken away from aid. And that has led to some shortfall. Mm. Um, but they're very restricted um, and few and far between. So yes, we are contributing to the protests, um, but minimum strength, the amount of officers you see on the street every day is always maintained. So we always have that emergency cover. There were a couple of issues that came up previously that concerned us, uh, and I'll paraphrase them uh, rather than go into detail. But one was in relation to the availability of uh, motor vehicles for um, specialist officers and others. And there was talk of officers having to take public transport to get to um, to get to residents and concerns. And, and the other was the sighting of specialist officers um, far away from uh, from Hillingdon, so that it was taking quite some considerable time for them to get to uh, events and issues within this borough. Uh, is that something that has been um, firmed up on and made better? Well, certainly, certainly cars are available, um, and, and my DWOs, you you fund cars for the local community, um, yeah. local, local community policing. In terms of the special officers, I assume you're referring to CID uh, and detectives who are based predominantly out of Hounslow and Acton. Um, yes. it, I certainly haven't noticed it, and I've never had an issue with detectives not making a crime scene. But the reason they're based at Acton is obviously detectives take on the, the post-incident investigation, and all the prisoners are generally taken to Acton or Hounslow, so that's where we need the experience and the the initial investigation, um, and I'm not aware of any complaints from staff about not having um, not having support. And we do put out detective cards that are allocated to to Hillingdon, so it's not as if you're kind of ignored. Oh, oh, all right, thank you. The, the other one was that, and I'm sure people remember this, was the very high figure of um, uh, 
post probationer officers in other words officers with very uh, short experience uh, being a high number in our borough I is that something that's being addressed and is there any capacity for ensuring that they have a degree of more senior mentoring um, the, the kind of impression we were getting last time was that there was a very significant number of highly well not highly of, of very inexperienced officers um, uh, as a proportion of the number of staff for Hillingdon well, we are. I mean, we all have to start somewhere, uh, in all fairness. And, and I do like having brand new officers on because they actually can tell me quite, quite keen and, and quite directed. At the moment, roughly about 40% of our response teams are made up of um, officers in their probation. Um, that varies per team. Some guys up, go up as high as about 50% across the borough. And, and that uplifting officers I mentioned for safe neighbourhoods, they are um, probationers. But they're each being given to a ward where we know we've got experienced officers who can actually, who not only can choose to them, but want to choose to them. Um, wards where there's a few issues, and I know they're actually going to learn something. The same with the neighbourhood tasking team. We've selected uh, by an application process three or four really experienced officers who will work with probationers to give them the skills necessary to actually become really good police officers, um, as well as supporting a, a really basic foundation course that the MET provides, each officer on team has a mentor to make sure that they are doing the learning and the improvement that they need. Um, that you, we can all see examples of, of people who are sometimes new and, and maybe take a while to learn, but similarly there are examples of people who are new and are really making a difference to the way we police and quite keen and are ready to get involved in supporting Hillington, and particularly because we've been recruiting from within London people who really understand the challenges and have been brought up in London and, and represent the people that we, we serve throughout the, um, the three boroughs. So it, it, having lots of probation is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, sometimes I would like everyone skilled and, and more courses and more drivers, but our response times at the moment, for example, are still well within the MET figures. Um, and we're not facing a serious, uh, any sort of serious, cha serious challenges. All right, thank you. Um, well, look, unless anybody else indicates, uh, Councillor Mathers, was that yeah. an indication? Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, my, my question is um, twofold, really. One, well, first one is the impact kind of COVID and now post COVID on uh, recruitment for the additional numbers um, promised uh, by the Prime Minister and, and if that's been delayed uh, because of inability to recruit during that period. Um, and the other one is what does the future look like for things such as? ward panels and other community engagements where residents can um, have that contact again with um, whether it be socially distanced or virtual with um, with officers. Councillor, thank you. Um, I'll firstly start with the recruitment. We've, we've over recruited at the moment um, and are slowing down our recruitment process because we've had so many applications. Um, we are actually in the Met well above our recruitment targets. So um, for example, um, the West area should have 1,159 officers. At the moment, we actually have 1,246, um, and, and that's replicated throughout London. So we are slowing down our recruitment um, so we can get our, our sort of catch up, really, with where we should have been. Um, because with COVID has seen such an increase in people wanting to join, and also it's seen a massive decrease in people leaving the force, whether those young in service who decide they don't want to no longer want to be police officers or those who are ready for retirement who no longer wish to retire. Um, so our, our, our figures at the moment are looking very, very good. Um, and I, I, what I don't know, of course, is, is in the long term in terms of COVID, whether any funding, any funding streams will be turned off by central government. Because we all know, and, and the councils are facing the same, that there is a huge financial hole um, staring at the government and how they choose to fill that and whether it will affect policing I, I, yet I don't know. Um, in terms of ward panels and, and virtual meetings, I mean, Teams has been an absolute bonus. We've done a lot of virtual ward panels. We've done a lot of questionnaires by email, and, and we've tried. I mean, there's been some really good local bits in the Helena Gazette about officers going out, physically helping members of the community and trying to be as visible um, as possible. And we haven't seen a reticence in people coming to, to meet us or taking up the technology necessary, uh, and that includes um, 
I'm not saying that the elderly aren't competent with computers, but certainly sections of society you might not think are brilliant at, at getting onto Teams or getting onto the way we communicate have been joining us in our virtual meetings and, and our ward panels. So we're still getting that feedback from the from the community, even though Teams drives me mad sometimes. All right, thank you. I, I, I can certainly say that um, in uh, areas that I'm familiar with, um, that there have been virtual ward panels taking place and, and very successfully so. Uh, and I think in some ways it's been a, a boon because we get to people that we wouldn't otherwise get to uh, who've been able to come in. All right, look, everybody, um, if, if anyone's got any uh, further comments or questions to ask, then please do. But I think um, uh, we've, we've, dealt, we've cut, uh, gone across a lot of uh, different areas and I'm very grateful to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, Dan and the team and... Um, uh, uh, Jackie uh, uh, and to the Chief Inspector for coming along and telling us about this what's been a very difficult and challenging time so um, I think we'll uh, uh, hold it there and thank you very much thank you thank you all right um, thank you as far as the committee members are concerned we will go on to item eight which is the work program Nikki Thank you, Chairman. Um, you will see from the agenda that um, I have put down meeting rooms for all of the remaining meetings for this municipal year. There's no decision made at the moment by members as to whether or not the future meetings will be virtual or whether they will be socially distanced face to face. Cabinet meeting is being held on the 24th of September, where we'll be trialing face-to-face -face meeting to see how that goes um, and subject to that being successful then members might want to think about whether or not they would like their future meetings to be virtual or socially distanced so we can we can deal with that at a future date but just to be aware of it um, there is a proposal that future meetings start at 6 30 because I, I know that as, as you all will be aware there are some members who um, who work and even with the um, a lot of people working from home it's still working and they are struggling to get here before six o'clock so there's a proposal that we start at 6 30. Um, so I'd like members um, agreement to that uh, so I can change the rest of the meetings for the municipal year. Um, also in terms of the subject matter of the future meetings um, we had on the 8th of October got a Hillingdon Hospital update scheduled. Um, I don't know if members still want to go ahead with that subject at that meeting. Um, the following meeting on the 10th of November, uh, we will be looking at getting updates from each of the trusts. So that will be CNWL, Royal Brompton, um, the London Ambulance Service um, and the CCG. Uh, and Hillington Hospital again at that one. That would be general updates. So um, it wouldn't cover, although Hillington Hospital would be present or should be present at that meeting, it won't necessarily be covering major issues and you wouldn't be able to go into any great depth on the redevelopment or any other issues to do with, um, Jason mentioned earlier about the CQC um, announcement tomorrow or the, the report coming out tomorrow. Um, so you wouldn't be able to, to actually go into any great depth on any of that. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's up to you what, what you'd like to do at those two meetings, October and November. I think that um, Jason telling us what he did earlier on, I don't know about the rest of you, came as a little bit of a surprise to me um, about um, the CQC uh, report in terms of the hospital's response to COVID. That might be, I mean, I'm second guessing here, that might be some of the issues concerning the former chief executive and um, how things went as far as that was concerned. Because I know that they, that the CQC were in the hospital in the weeks leading up to her resignation. So whether that's what he was or trying to hint on, I don't know. Um, or whether it's something more that we don't know about that's going to come out tomorrow. But I would, I would want, us to know about that pretty swiftly whether it's um appropriate to wait a month or not i don't know so what i'm going to suggest is that um nikki and i look into that and see what the um what the shape of that is and if necessary uh, depending on what it is if, if it's just a going back over what we kind of knew already then we could leave it until the next meeting but if it's something more um 
pressing, then perhaps we may need to meet, um, as this forum is possible to do, um, more uh, speedily. But le perhaps if you'll le leave leave that for us to have a look at and see what that's about, because it, it, it struck me that it could either be that which we already know or something new. Um, as far as allowing them, well, not allowing them, as far as encouraging them to come to us uh, uh, as part of their engagement and part of their um, uh, uh, desire to tell us about various aspects and stages of the new build is concerned. Um, uh, uh, clearly, that's something that they're going to want to do. And it may be a little bit early yet for perhaps the intensity of the sort of meetings that we're going to be looking at further down the line. Um, if they are going to be asking us about services and the, the shape of provision, Ian Goodman's um, response about the different ways of looking at things, Sir Neil's uh, encouragement to look at different ways of of, uh, of of dealing with medical practice, I think is very encouraging. Uh, and it may be that we get something similar to what we really want uh, as well um, in that by that route. So giving them the opportunity and encouraging them as we have done to come to us uh, at a time uh, when they're ready and when they've got things to tell us about, I think is important. Um, I'm sure uh, the rest of you go along with that. Yes, nods, excellent, good, 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 good. All right, so um, I think for the moment we we perhaps play it by ear a bit, um, but leave that that September, leave that October uh, date uh, free for uh, maybe an update from. Jason about where they're going and so forth uh, or if not we'll look at something else and and we'll put an email around to see what we can do about that. Um, an, um, an alternative might be if when it comes to it um, is that the Mount Vernon Cancer Centre review is starting yeah. to speed yeah. up again now yeah. Yeah. so yeah. They're, they're starting to, to do more consultation again so yeah. that might be something we could look at. And it may be that uh, it may be a timely uh, a uh, 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 point to get them in and and um, hear what they've got to say because that's quite interesting. Uh, the uh, the cancer update and I, I, offline, um, I'd been looking into the whole business of um, of how, irrespective of the uh, hospital build, um, we might help or, or input as far as the uh, cancer services at Mount Vernon are concerned because one of the things that was raised with us when we went to the um, very large joint meeting was facilities at that site. And one of the things that was highlighted to us um, was the fact that there are buildings on that site which are both condemned um, and um, listed, which is quite uh, an interesting uh, juxtaposition, which I've uh, discussed with certain experts um, one of whom sits at the moment amongst us, um, about how this is entirely possible to have a listed building that's condemned and and, and, and could be better used. So there, there's, a, there's a job of work to be doing there. But as you know, um, the Mount Vernon site is not in any way um, included at the moment in their thinking as far as the new build is concerned. So let's just let them get on with uh, what they have to do. All right. Um, any other comments about the work programme from anybody? Chair, um, if I may, we spoke, um, I think, in the informal meeting just about other bodies, um, and I was keen to see if we could get um, Network Rail, TfL and others involved in station developments, particularly on the main line out from Paddington, um, but also just generally scrutinising the transport links that we're having developed or that are in current play um, would be, I feel, useful. In, in regard to, to what, the hospital or generally? Oh, no, sorry, sorry gem, not, uh, separate from health. Um, oh, okay, further yeah. In the, further in the work plan, particularly developments of the stations, um, I'm thinking Hayes and Harlington and West Straighton, the impact you're that's having on... Crossrail. Pardon? You're talking about the delay in Crossrail? Uh, potentially, also, um, just the way in which they are, uh, other plans that they've had in the past and how it improves bus routes and general... Um, Hillenden resident experiences get a lot of um, scrutiny, I think, as councillors about different transport things. Um, and although there's different funding going in here and there, it's difficult to 
make sure that any changes going forward are always um, Hillian and orientated as a local authority, not just through the um, LGA. Chairman, as far as the meeting in January is concerned, 12th of January 2021, at the moment we only have scheduled on that meeting a GP pressures update, so the, uh, the implementation of the recommendations from that review that was undertaken by the panel. So could we, could we slot something in on that? Yeah, yeah, it's a good idea. Yeah, I mean, we'd have to look at how we did it and, and, and um, the, the sort of scope of it. It's a very big subject, obviously. I mean, we've we've always known, haven't we, that 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 the, the the kind of lateral communications are far better than the whatever the equivalent of side to side to lateral is. Um, so go, get, going from one end of the borough to the other, uh, from side to side, is very difficult as opposed to going into London and out again. So that 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 kind of challenge is is quite interesting. I think that the Crossrail issue is well, it, it's far beyond our pay grade if you like um in a sense because it seems to have ever more um uh, difficulties and complexities but 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 a um a, a look at the if, if if perhaps if um if uh councillor mathis if you might uh, jot down some sort of areas uh, some areas of interest or areas of questioning uh, and pop them into nikki we can have a look at the sort of scope uh, of, of that and then we can come back and then we can come back at a more recent uh, meeting and talk about that for January. Yeah, of course, happy to. Excellent. All right, thank you. Anybody else? No, nope. everyone's looking terribly tired. All right. Um, well, unless there's anything further on that, um, I think we can draw things to a close. Uh, and um, thank you very much to everybody for attending. If the members could just stay on the on the line for a few moments after Nikki's finished the uh, live streaming, I'd be grateful. All right, thank you very much. I'll close the meeting.